Uh, my name is James Dunlop. I'm a senior engineer with the Carbon Trust. Uh, I've worked here for around eight years and during a, a lot of that time I've looked closely at uh, energy efficient lighting and in particular the advance of LED technology. Uh, so today we're going to uh, look at lighting. We're going to look at the importance of good lighting. Uh, what traditional lighting options are typically out there at businesses across the country, uh, the benefits of switching to LED technology and also other things to consider when it comes to uh, LED replacement solutions. And we'll also give more information on the Green Business Fund. So just to give a, a brief overview of the Carbon Trust, uh, we are a not-for-profit organisation with a mission to accelerate the move to a sustainable, low-carbon economy. Uh, we provide advice to businesses, uh, governments and the public sector on uh, opportunities in a low-carbon world. We also provide footprinting advice where we measure and certify the environmental footprint of organisations, products and services and we also help to develop and deploy uh, low carbon technologies and solutions. This webinar uh, which is provided under the Green Business Fund is really to provide an understanding of what constitutes uh, good lighting and uh, also to help you evaluate the type of lighting that you have at your site. Uh, to understand the cost saving benefits of switching to low energy sources which these days are, are typically LED solutions and also to understand the other benefits of moving to LED technologies. We'll also give you more information on the Green Business Fund itself uh, which can help you identify lighting and other savings at your site uh, and can also help you to obtain competitive prices from accredited lighting suppliers and also we'll give you more information on the 15% uh, capital contribution that's uh, available towards energy efficiency projects. And typically moving to LED can reduce your lighting costs by 70%. It's a step change in technology and there's great opportunities for saving. Uh, so it's something that can be taken advantage of uh, by all businesses. And as you can see on, on this slide, all businesses have a requirement for lighting. The extent will vary from sector to sector. Uh, you can see the likes of uh, warehousing, uh, storage facilities will have a very high percentage of their energy use on lighting. But it's ubiquitous across all uh, business types and upgrading to uh, better solutions will provide savings uh, for, for most businesses. So we'll look next at what uh, constitutes uh, good lighting. So lighting is important for a range of, of reasons. Uh, firstly, for health and well-being. Also, it's important to have the correct level of light uh, for safety uh, and to uh, ensure a good working environment. Uh, light color too is important, as is color rendering, uh, minimizing glare and reducing your energy and carbon uh, costs. So we'll, we'll look at each of those aspects in a bit more detail on the following slides. So firstly, uh, lighting impacts on our well-being. Uh, the circadian rhythm is heavily influenced by light and we're beginning to understand more and more of that. Uh, but the important thing is to have good light quality, to have appropriate light color uh, and uh, that will create a positive effect on the working environment. Uh, light also impacts our ability to work accurately. You can see here from the charts that the greater the light level, uh, as we're describing it here, as a luminance uh, or lux, so that's really the level of light uh, that you get on a, on a surface. As that increases, uh, relative errors in the workplace uh, decrease uh, and also the work rate, work rate can increase as well. That's to uh, a certain extent, uh, obviously you can see there as uh, both aspects uh, tail off uh, in around 500, uh, 600 lux. The level of light uh, required will vary from area to area uh, across business types. Uh, you can see there the likes of offices have a requirement for around uh, 500 lux. 
uh, that would be typical uh, in most office environments where people are uh, reading uh, printouts uh, using computers and the likes. Uh, for corridors and um, areas that are used less frequently, uh, much lower levels can be used in around 100 lux is appropriate. Uh, and in some instances uh, where you have very uh, detailed tasks and inspections to carry out, carry out these higher levels of uh, illumination are, are required. Light colour as well is an important aspect and it's something uh, that uh, I suppose uh, LED technology has uh, developed to provide a, a range, a, a wider range uh, of options on uh, in terms of its, uh, its output. So light colour uh, is measured in Kelvin and it describes the colour appearance of light. So in practical terms, uh, 1800 Kelvin would be a very warm amber light, uh, almost like a candle light, uh, and in around 6500 Kelvin uh, would be equivalent to daylight. So depending on your environment, you'll want to pick uh, the right uh, colour temperature. So for the likes of uh, hospitality environment, you might be in around two and a half uh, to three thousand Kelvin. For an office, you might want that slightly higher again, uh, in around the three thousand to three and a half thousand Kelvin. Uh, and in some production facilities, you may want to go higher still to four thousand, four and a half thousand Kelvin. Uh, but there's no need, to, uh, in particular, to go to the very high levels, which tends to be a more whitish, uh, bluish light. Uh, and it's possible then to specify uh, the color temperature that you require uh, for your, your relevant space. Color rendering is another aspect uh, and it really defines the ability of lighting to show colors uh, effectively. You can see here on this slide, uh, there's an example of a, a scarf there in daylight. Uh, so that would be uh, RA100 would be the, the color rendering index for that. Uh, and you can see there you, you're able to distinguish the particular colors uh, of the scarf. Seeing that same scarf under uh, street lighting, uh, you're not seeing the colors uh, as easily. So that type of orange sodium street lighting has a very low uh, color rendering index in around RA5. And it isn't possible uh, to distinguish with the colors. So again, whenever you're, you're specifying a, a new lighting system, it's beneficial uh, to look at the, the color rendering index that's going to be provided uh, and to put that uh, at least over 80 and uh, as, as high as possible in, in most cases, with RA100 being ideal. Glare as well is another aspect to consider and really what you're trying to avoid is uh, excessive or uncontrolled brightness. This is defined uh, under European standards and there's a unified glare rating. So for the likes of an office environment, uh, you'll want to have a unified glare rating of less than 19. So that impacts on the way lights are laid out in a space, uh, the number of, of uh, individual units that you might have, and uh, the amount of light uh, from each individual source. So it may be the case that you're better off with a larger number of lower output luminaires uh, to minimize the glare in a space uh, and to improve the, uh, the, the comfort. And of course, the, the main reason of the presentation today is that uh, we're emphasizing that good lighting should minimize your energy consumption. Uh, so in particular, the LED light sources can reduce the lighting power by as much as 80% uh, when compared to uh, incandescent sources. Uh, there's still significant savings when moving uh, from fluorescent solutions, even uh, from low energy compact fluorescent solutions. Um, so essentially you're wanting to reduce the amount of light or the amount of uh, energy required in your lighting at the source. In addition to that, there's no point in lighting a space if there's nobody there. So the use of presence detection uh, can ensure that lighting switched off uh, when it's not required, uh, when there's nobody in the space. 
and as well as that, if you have good uh, available natural light uh, from roof, roof lights or from windows, that free daylight can be taken advantage of uh, and the artificial lighting can dim back or switch off uh, based on sensor controls and that again can, can minimise uh, your energy costs uh, on lighting. So from what we're seeing through the Green Business Fund and through the uh, projects that are coming through to us, 70 to 80 percent is, is fairly typical uh, in the reduction in lighting costs. So there's a significant opportunity uh, for savings by upgrading to LED lighting. This first uh, case study highlights that. Uh, it's from a company called Blackout Limited, uh, who are one of the, the larger uh, events countries companies. Um, basically, they were able to uh, upgrade their existing lighting into warehouses. They're operating the warehouses 50 hours a week, uh, and they spent £47,000 uh, upgrading uh, the, uh, the warehouses to LED. Uh, they got savings uh, of around £9,000 a year, uh, giving a, a good return on investment. And uh, overall, the lighting savings were, were 76% in this instance. We supported them with a capital contribution. At that time, the uh, cap was slightly higher. The current cap on the capital contribution is uh, £5,000. Uh, but as you can see there, it's still a, a significant sum towards uh, towards lighting projects. So we'll just move on now to talk about uh, traditional lighting options and uh, the tr conventional lighting that you'll find uh, in many businesses currently. So lighting has uh, really evolved over the last uh, 200 years. Uh, the first electric lamp uh, would have been back in the, the 1800s uh, and fluorescent technology would have been developed in around the, the 1920s. So essentially uh, it is old technology uh, and really it's been the, the, the rise of LED technology that's come through uh, from the, the late 90s that has uh, made a significant difference um, to the way that we're, we're running lighting now. Uh, so Firstly, just looking at, at the various different types, incandescent uh, tungsten filament lights would be fairly common. They'd be used widely in uh, domestic applications uh, and as I'm sure you know, they've been uh, phased out over the, the uh, past few years uh, as we move to more uh, efficient sources. So there's, there's some figures on each of these slides just looking at the various different existing uh, lighting types. Uh, so on each of them we're looking at the colour temperature. So you can see here that uh, incandescent lighting typically has a relatively low colour temperature of around two and a half to 3000 Kelvin. It has good colour rendering properties, uh, generally around 100. But as you can see here, the efficacy in terms of the light output to the energy input, it, it is low. So you can see here there's a range uh, of around 5 to 20 uh, lumens per watt. So you're not getting that much light out of each watt of energy. Uh, and you'll see the improvements on the other sources as we go through those. The other factor as well is that they have very poor uh, running hours. So the running hours is around 1,000 uh, before the lamp fails. A slight variant on that and an improvement on that is the tungsten halogen lamps. So in those cases, it's an incandescent lamp that has a small amount of, of halogen uh, in the lamp, which improves the performance of the filament. These are still fairly widely used in hospitality uh, retail display areas. They have um, color temperature uh, in around 3,200. Uh, Kelvin, again, good color rendering, which is primarily why they're used in hospitality and display. The efficacy is slightly improved, but again, they have very short uh, running hours. And again, you'll be familiar with the fluorescent lamps that you get uh, across many businesses. And these come in uh, typically T8 or T5, which defines the uh, the type of the, the fitting. The, the T8 is a, is a larger, wider tube. The T5 is a thinner, uh, more modern 
tube. But in both cases, um, there are improvements to be had by going to LED technology. Uh, the color temperature, again, can vary depending on what's required, uh, typically from in around 3000 Kelvin up to 6500. The, the color rendering index is slightly lower than the incandescent sources we've looked at. The efficacy is, is much improved, uh, but again, still uh, below the performance of LED technology. Uh, and so too is the lamp life. It's much better than your incandescent sources. Compact fluorescence, again, they would have been a, an early uh, energy saving technology. Uh, again, you'd be familiar with these from your, your home as well. They're extensively used. Uh, the, the color temperature uh, of those fittings is around uh, 3000 to 4000 Kelvin. Color rendering about 85. The efficacy uh, in terms of lumens per watt uh, isn't brilliant. It's in around uh, 50 to 80 uh, lumens per watt. So again, even though they are low energy fittings, uh, significant improvements can be had uh, by moving to LED. Lamp life too, whilst it's an improvement, is still not uh, as good as the, the, the LED solutions that we'll come on to. And then in more industrial uh, applications, you'll tend to find the likes of uh, high pressure sodium uh, fittings. These are also used in, in street lighting. You can see here that they have very poor levels of uh, color rendering. Um, they also have uh, lower uh, color temperatures and uh, have much improved efficacy levels. So they are providing a, a, a relatively good uh, output in terms of their, their lumen per watt. And again, the lamp life is an improvement on the other sources, but uh, still not uh, equivalent to that of the, the LED technology. And then the, the final existing light type that we'll look at here is the metal halide lamp. Uh, that again is, is quite often used in, in retail environments. It has quite a long startup time, so it takes quite a while uh, to get up to temperature. Uh, as much as, as five minutes before it reaches full illumination. It has um, relatively good properties in terms of color rendering and also efficacy. The lamp life, again, isn't fantastic uh, in around uh, 10,000 to 20,000 hours uh, from those types of fittings. So really, to, summary, uh, to summarize on those light uh, types, uh, they all have their own characteristics, but in each case, uh, moving to LED technology will provide uh, benefits in terms of light quality, in terms of efficacy, and in terms of the, the, the lamp life as well. And just looking at another case study here, uh, this is for TOT shirts. They're one of the UK's leading t-shirt printing uh, and garment decorators. They received uh, 10,000 pounds again that was uh, prior to the change in, in the cap uh, from ourselves as a, as a capital contribution. But in terms of the overall project, you can see here that they invested around 36,000 uh, pounds, got an annual saving of 18,000 pounds and a project payback of 1.4 years. So again, that was a very attractive project for them. And part of the reason that that was as attractive is down to their, their running hours, so where they had a much, uh, longer running hours than the previous example, uh, they're able to see the payback at a much lower level. So we'll just take a closer look now at, uh, at LED lighting. Um, as we discussed previously, the performance of LED solutions has effectively surpassed all the other technology types. You can see here in this graph, it ended in around uh, 2010, but the performance of LED has continued to improve over the last uh, seven or eight years, uh, and it now surpasses all the other lighting types on the chart. And again, that will continue to improve as the technology advances. So looking here, you can see that it has the, the highest efficiency and the, the longest life of the lighting types that we've looked at uh, so far. There's an ability to um, specify the color temperature uh, in whatever level that you require it. 
uh, and it also provides good levels of color rendering. So it's, it's rapidly becoming the, the light source of choice for all sectors and for all applications. And then we just have a few practical examples here of uh, LED use uh, in different business types. So looking here at a, a warehouse and production space, uh, we're, we're looking in each case at the energy cost for each individual light uh, across a year. And that's based on continuous operation for uh, busy production areas. So in the, the first example here, we're looking at a, a 400 watt metal halide luminaire. Uh, the running cost for each individual luminaire is £385. Uh, so that's significant in itself, but whenever we look then at the alternatives, if you were to go with uh, fluorescent solutions uh, using T5 fluorescence uh, with 220 watt uh, lamps in total, the running cost will be in around £212. And a lot of businesses may well have upgraded uh, to that type of solution maybe five years ago, ten years ago. Uh, it was very prevalent at that stage and provided good savings in comparison to the likes of the metal halide. Uh, the advantage though of moving towards LED is again a, a lower running cost again. So that 400 watt metal halide fitting that we're looking at on the left uh, could effectively be replaced by a 150 watt LED and that would lead to running costs of in around £130 a year. So you can see there that there's a, a significant difference and a uh, significant saving. Looking at the office environment, a uh, fairly common type of lighting would be the uh, twin fluorescent. So that twin fluorescent uh, 58 watt example on the top left will have a, a running cost of around £50 a year. Again, that's based on a single light uh, where we're looking at a unit cost of around 12p per unit in this case uh, and operation five days a week, uh, 12 hours a day. Uh, so that would be around £50 for the twin T8 fluorescent. Looking at the slight improvement to T5 fluorescent technology, we'd be talking uh, at about £39 uh, per year per fitting. Moving to LED, you'd be likely to be able to use a 48 watt LED to provide the equivalent level of light uh, and that would have a cost of around £20 a year. So again, significant savings in the office environment going from uh, conventional fluorescent technology to LED. N another light type is highlighted below and that's the, um, I suppose, the fairly common 600 by 600 uh, panel that you'll get in your ceiling. So quite often that can be provided by 4 by 18 watt T8s, uh, as you'll see as an example on the left. And in that case, the annual cost per fitting would be around £32 a year. Moving to an improved solution that uses uh, T5 luminaires, that's going to improve uh, to around £17 a year based on uh, 3 by 14 watt T5s. But again, you can get further savings by going to LED. So using LED panels, uh, in this case at around 30 watts each, that running cost drops uh, back down to 11 pounds per fitting uh, per year. So again, that's a, a significant improvement on the conventional technology. And then beyond that, uh, as we talked about earlier, there are opportunities to improve the controls of the fittings, uh, to look at presence detection uh, and to look at daylight dimming as well. And that'll help to uh, reduce that figure further. So we'll just take a look at a third case study here. Uh, this is uh, Pentagon Plastics. Uh, again, they're, they're looking at replacement of factory lighting. Um, Using daylight dimming was a recommendation there, and uh, the project cost was in around £14,000. Uh, the annual saving was about £4,700, leading to a project payback of just over two years. The lighting savings in this case uh, were 62%. So again, it's a good uh, return on investment. And again, 
we're able to support it with our uh, capital contribution as well. So uh, Pentagon benefited from uh, an energy saving assessment from ourselves. These are free uh, through the Green Business Fund. We'll give some more information on those uh, later as well. But if, if you're unsure as to what are the right options for you, then getting an initial assessment uh, can be of, of benefit. So we'll just look at the, some other considerations for your, your lighting projects as well. We'd mentioned before the use of controls uh, as well as minimizing the energy use of your light source. Uh, minimizing its operation will be beneficial. So using presence detection, uh, this would be commonly used in toilets and corridor areas uh, to make sure the lighting's not on unless it's needed to be on uh, will be beneficial. Also looking as we discussed earlier at uh, daylight dimming, uh, making sure that the light uh, dims back in areas where you've got good natural daylight from windows and from roof lights. Also basic measures such as uh, time control can be very beneficial where you have fixed uh, operating hours in offices uh, if the lights are t simply timed to switch off at the end of the, uh, the working day it avoids that human factor uh, and avoids uh, people having to, uh, to, to switch off the lighting. Another useful uh, tip is, is the use of a last person light switch. So quite often you can have complex uh, arrangements on lighting multiple switches uh, and that leads to uncertainty as to what needs to be switched off. So if there's a single switch that can be switched at the end of the day uh, that can help to, uh, to minimize any energy wastage out of ours. Also for external lighting, uh, the use of photo cell control uh, will be beneficial. Uh, so that will ensure that the, the external lighting is only on during the hours of darkness. And again, that will be best used in conjunction with time control, uh, again, to make sure that the lighting isn't on right through the night uh, unless it's needed. And other practical things to consider, you might want to look at the condition of your wiring. Uh, is it due for replacement if you're upgrading your lighting? Do you need to upgrade your wiring uh, as well as the, the fittings themselves? Is your current uh, layout best suited to your needs? Uh, should you consider a redesign uh, of the, the lighting layout? Um, potentially it is easiest to change on a point for point basis, but you may get more benefit by uh, changing the layout of your, your lighting. You may be able to use less fittings. You may be able to get uh, the, the fittings located in better places, especially down the, the aisles in, uh, in warehouses, for example. And also, it'd be worth looking at your emergency lighting provision at that time to make sure that it uh, meets the requirements and it provides uh, the, the necessary uh, coverage for your building. And the other factor as well is do you want to replace all of your, your lighting? Um, it may be the case if you're uh, involved in, in retail, for example, you may want to change the areas that are, are used for the longest hours. Uh, if you have uh, lighting in, in the um, customer areas, they may be the priority for replacement. The, the ones in the back areas may not. Um, so again, areas where you've got low usage, uh, they may already have minimal lighting costs. Uh, so depending on your business needs, you might want to look at a, a full replacement of all your lighting systems or to prioritize certain areas. Okay, so I'll just give some further information now on the, uh, the Green Business Fund itself. It's essentially a scheme that's operated by the Carbon Trust uh, to provide uh, improved sustainability and energy efficiency. It's aimed at small and medium-sized businesses in England, Scotland and Wales. Uh, it's currently run successfully from last year through this year and we plan to run it uh, further into 2018. So we provide a combination of advice, training and uh, direct uh, financial contribution towards projects uh, and, and if we can we would aim to, to run the scheme longer and to extend it uh, in the UK and perhaps uh, internationally. 
so just to look at, take a closer look at the eligibility for this scheme, essentially it's available to small businesses in England, Scotland and Wales only. And what um, qualifies you as, a, as an SME is laid out here on this slide. So basically, it's uh, small, medium-sized businesses. Schools are also included, uh, sole traders uh, and uh, charities as well. So you need to meet two of the following criteria. Uh, you need to have no more than 250 employees, an annual turnover not in excess of 25.9 million, uh, and also an annual ban balance sheet not in excess of 12.9 million. So uh, two out of the three of those uh, need to be met to define you as, a, as an SME. And beyond that as well, uh, it needs to be the case that not more than 25% of your organisation is owned by an entity that's a non-SME effectively. So you, you wouldn't need to have a controlling interest by a, a larger business. And in terms of the strands of support, uh, there, there's four main areas. Uh, firstly, we provide workshops. These are hosted uh, uh, and delivered by the Carbon Trust, and they uh, aim to improve understanding of energy consumption to help you identify no and low cost measures. And we've been running these uh, around the country uh, over the past year. At present, the, the next one that's coming up is in uh, Sittingbourne uh, next week on the 22nd of November and I think then there will be plans for further workshops uh, then into next year. The other area to look at and quite often the entry point that uh, companies come to us for is the opportunity assessments. So we can provide these remotely uh, for smaller businesses or we can provide a, a site uh, audit for uh, companies with larger energy spends. They'll be carried out by Carbon Trust engineers. We'll aim to identify the three main priorities for you in terms of energy saving recommendations. So they'll quite often focus on uh, lighting opportunities uh, because of the level of opportunity there uh, and then we'll, we'll lay those out in terms of the uh, savings and also the expected capital costs uh, for the measures. We also provide support then beyond that um, once we've made our recommendations in the initial report we will uh, outline suitable suppliers from our green business directory. Uh, these are accredited suppliers that have um, gone through our processes to be listed uh, with the Carbon Trust. And we can also run uh, tenders for you if you want to get competitive prices uh, from two or more suppliers. We can set up a tender process, lay out your requirements, uh, and also uh, review the returns look at the uh, proposals in terms of the whole life cost and weigh up the uh, the best options for you. Again, this is also uh, provided uh, free of charge to eligible companies. And then beyond that, we offer 15% uh, towards the project costs. Uh, so that 15% applies where the project pays back in five years or less. And that is often the case with uh, with lighting projects where the payback extends beyond five years. Uh, it still is eligible uh, for support. But in those cases, we offer 15% uh, of five times the annual savings. So that limits it just uh, slightly further. Other financial support that we offer includes the interest-free loan uh, for the Green Business Scheme. This is available in Wales as well. Uh, so it's a separate scheme, sorry, to the, the Green Business Fund effectively, but it, it is available in tandem with the capital contribution in Wales. Uh, local funding has meant that it operates both in Wales and Northern Ireland within the UK. And the premise of, premise of the scheme is that we lend a thousand pounds for every one and a half tons uh, of CO2 saved annually. So there's online calculators that can help you work that out. Uh, and for those of you in Wales, the uh, level of support ranges right from three thousand pounds up to two hundred thousand pounds. So it is a good opportunity um, 
for uh, larger SMEs to avail of and to look at uh, larger investment projects there. It'll also be worth reviewing uh, options to uh, buy equipment that's on the energy technology list. Uh, in these cases, uh, organisations that pay income or corporation tax can claim the enhanced capital allowances or the ECAs on the purchase of ETL equipment. So that can be a further financial benefit uh, for companies and again that can be applied in tandem to the, to the capital contributions. Okay, so that uh, that concludes the, the main part of the presentation. Just to take an opportunity to pick up on any questions that have come through during the presentation. Okay, so we had one question and yep. she's asked, what is typical saving moving from T5 fluorescent lighting to LED? It'll depend on, on running hours and the likes, but typically uh, in around 50% is achievable. Okay, James, we have... Uh, Another question here, and the question is, as the Green Business Fund is not available for the public sector, does the Carbon Trust provide any similar funds for local authorities in particular? Not that I'm aware of. I think there has been Celix funding, which is a separate funding stream from us, uh, available for the public sector. Uh, that may still be available. 